Welcome back to Galatians, a City Rise series. My name is Bradley, and in this series, we've been walking through the book of Galatians. Here, we're in Galatians 4. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, who were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. I love this passage so much. And I think I say that about every single chunk of this book, but it is just so good. I love that we are not slaves, we are children. I mean, that on its own is so encouraging. We're no longer slaves to sin. We are children of God. But notice that Paul says, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if you're a son, then you are an heir. You are heirs to the kingdom of God. We will inherit that. That is just such a powerful thing that Paul speaks about us. And I also love that Paul notes here that when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. This reminds me of uh, what Gregory, a third or fourth century church father said, where he says, that which is not assumed cannot be redeemed. What he means by that is that Christ was born as a man. He's actually referring to Christ having a rational mind so that he can redeem having a rational mind being a human. And in this case, Paul's saying, so that he can redeem being born under the law. For those that were born under the law, as we learn in Galatians 3, they're trapped by sin. Um, But when Christ is born under the law, and then he does his reconciling work of crucifixion, resurrection, and exaltation, those things are now pushed away because Christ born under the law redeems the law because he has assumed that kind of being. I love in verse six also that you are sons. God has sent his son to your heart crying out, Abba, Father. I don't know about you, but in my conversion experience, in my life, when I came to recognize that Jesus Christ was was my Lord and Savior, I felt like this, my heart crying out, Father, Father. Abba is, is just this beautiful, packed word. It's got so much meaning to it. It simultaneously has has like the father figure and the authority and also the, the closeness of of dad. And I just love that, that that is in our English version of the Bible, untranslated, um, that they've left Abba in there for us rather than just saying father, father. I mean, there's a lot here for us to talk about. Here's a couple discussion questions for you and your community group to discuss as we work our way through Galatians 4.
I hope that was a good time of discussion. We're now going to continue through Galatians 4, starting in verse 8, reading all the way out to verse 20. Follow along with me in your copy of God's Word. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid I may have labored over you in vain. Brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. You know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. What then has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose. And not only when I am present with you, my little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. That was a long chunk, and, and, and there's a lot in there. There's a couple things that I really want to point out. The first is that when you did not know God, you were enslaved by those that by nature are not gods. I don't know about you, but in my life, there are moments where, where I am tempted to put things close to God, maybe equal to God, and, and, and God forbid, maybe above God. There are things that we call idols that we put in our lives. And I love that, that Paul is talking about, man, when you did not know God, you were enslaved by these idols, these things that aren't God. By their very nature, they're not God. I also love that he goes on to say, am I becoming your enemy by telling you the truth? This is verse 16. I've had a lot of hard conversations in my life. Sometimes I have to confront someone and sometimes someone is confronting me. When we're in Christian fellowship and in Christian community, we should not allow the truth to make enemies of people. And even outside of Christian community, if you have a friend or a coworker that, that you need to confront, confront them in a way that you don't become enemies. I think that Paul is saying uh, in, in some way that even when we're telling the truth, we ought not to do that with, with hatred. Uh, we, we ought not to be brutally honest, emphasis on the brutal. I think we ought to be honest, emphasis on the honest. I think that's something that Paul is, is telling us here, that, that even in telling truth, we can do so in love, not making enemies. Another thing that is fantastic here is, is starting in verse 19, my little children, I'm in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. I don't know if you've ever been in a, in a solid discipleship relationship. I've had some where I've been discipled by some great men and, and I've had the opportunity to disciple some younger than me. And I, I resonate with this, this idea of childbirth where, where you're discipling someone and you're like, I, you're so close to understanding or, or, or to, to defeating this sin or, or to living out the thing that we're working on living out. And, and it almost is like this physical pain, like childbirth, as you're watching somebody conform or, or be transformed into the image of God. And I can only imagine in my life, my parents and, and my pastors and the teachers and disciplers that, that have been a part of my life, how much childbirth pain I have given them as I have slowly walked my way into being transformed into the image of God. Uh, another thing to note, and this is just a, a note for you as you read this, Paul notes that it is a physical ailment that has brought him to the Galatians. Uh, he then says that you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. This leads us to believe that on one of Paul's missionary journeys, he has to take a break to deviate from doing God's work because something is wrong with his eyes. We don't know a lot. We don't know exactly what's going on, but it seems that that is how Paul has met this particular church, was that he has deviated from one of his missionary journeys and that he lived and worked with them while he uh, was rehabilitating himself. I think that's beautiful that, that Paul has a book in the Bible written to people that weren't originally in his plan, but they were in God's plan. I think that's an awesome story and an awesome testament to God's sovereignty, that even when someone isn't planning, God is. Here's a couple questions to talk about as we process all of these verses.
We're now here at the end of Galatians 4. We've got a handful of verses to close out. Read along with me as, as we read Galatians 4, 21 through 31. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. So what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. In my notes on Galatians 4, I have this titled, A Powerful Polemic. This is Paul at his rhetorical best. Paul is taking the Judaizers, a group that we've talked about throughout all of these videos, the group that is instigating and stirring up trouble at the church in Galatia. And Paul says, let's take an Old Testament example of this, Hagar and Sarah. Now the Judaizers, they want to be Sarah. They want to be the mother of Isaac, of course. These are devoutly Jewish men. And Paul takes the story of Hagar and Sarah and switches the script up to where the Judaizers, the devoutly Jewish men, actually find themselves following in the line of Hagar, where it's Paul and, and this new Christian movement that finds themselves in the line of Sarah. It's about the promise, not the flesh. I also love this use of Isaiah. This is Isaiah 54, I believe. Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor, because the children of the desolate one will be more than of the one who has a husband. Just like we talked about in this last chunk of Galatians 4, I just love this image that even when things aren't going well, even, even when life isn't going according to your plan, even if, if you have a plan and you're missing some steps along the way, God has a plan. Even for you who, who does not have a child, there is blessing for you. And I think that that is immediately useful for the story of Sarah, who of course gave birth for the first time at 90 years old. But I think it's just a, a useful reminder for us that, that God has a plan for us that goes above and beyond what we plan for ourselves. And, and finally, I love this reminder in 31, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. We tie that in with the talk of Jerusalem in verses 25 and 26, that the Jerusalem that exists presently is enslaved, but the Jerusalem above, the new Jerusalem, heaven, that is where we're free. It's important to remember that, that we are citizens of the United States or of earth or, or whatever country you're from. We do live here, but our inheritance that we've talked about throughout this, that not slaves, but sons, and, and if sons and inheritors, heirs, we are inheriting something from the new Jerusalem, something eternal, something heavenly. That is the promise that you and I have as children of God. Here's a couple more questions for you to close out Galatians 4 in conversation.
Well, thank you for joining us for Galatians, the City Rise series. We are done with chapter four. That means we are two thirds of the way through the book of Galatians. I'll see you in the next video for Galatians 5.